Welcome to SnoozeCast, the podcast designed to help you fall asleep. On SnoozeCast, we read excerpts from public domain works and occasionally original stories. New episodes come out every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. We'd like to thank our listeners. If you enjoy our show, please follow us on social media, write us a review, and also share it with a friend. The best place to listen to us is on our website, snoozecast.com. That way, you can play a single episode and fall asleep without another one automatically playing. This episode is supported by Fluffy Robes and Warm Slippers. Tonight, I'll be reading the opening to the 1905 essay collection, Old Fashioned Flowers, by Belgian author Maurice Maeterlinck. Maeterlinck, who lived from 1862 to 1949, was awarded the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1911. This book is an ode to flowers and springtime. Let's get cozy. Close your eyes. Relax your body into the softness of your bed. Now, take a few deep breaths. Old Fashioned Flowers This morning, when I went to look at my flowers, Surrounded by their white fence, which protects them against the good cattle grazing in the field beyond, I saw again in my mind all that blossoms in the woods, the fields, the gardens, the orangeries, and the greenhouses. And I thought of all that we owe to the world of marvels which the bees visit. Can we conceive what humanity would be if it did not know the flowers? If these did not exist? If they had all been hidden from our gaze? As are probably a thousand no less fairy sights that are all around us, but invisible to our eyes? Would our character, our faculties, our sense of the beautiful, our aptitude for happiness be quite the same? We should, it is true, in nature have other splendid manifestations of luxury, exuberance, and grace, other dazzling efforts of the superfluous forces, the sun, the stars, the varied lights of the moon, the azure, and the ocean, the dawns and twilights, the mountain, the plain, the forest and the rivers, the light and the trees, and lastly, nearer to us, birds, precious stones, and woman. These are the ornaments of our planet. Yet but for the last three, which belong to the same smile of nature, how grave, austere, almost sad, would be the education of our eye without the softness which the flowers give. Suppose for a moment that our globe knew them not, a great region the most enchanted in the joys of our psychology, would be destroyed, or rather would not be discovered. All of a delightful sense would sleep forever at the bottom of our harder and more desert hearts, and in our imagination stripped of worshipful images. 
the infinite world of colors and shades would have been but incompletely revealed to us by a few rents in the sky. The miraculous harmonies of light at play, ceaselessly inventing new gaieties, reveling in itself, would be unknown to us, for the flowers first broke up the prism and made the most subtle portion of our sight. And the magic garden of perfumes, who would have opened its gate to us? A few grasses, a few gums, a few fruits, the breath of the dawn, the smell of the night and the sea, would have told us that beyond our eyes and ears there existed a shut paradise where the air which we breathe changes into delights for which we could have found no name. Consider also all that the voice of human happiness would lack. One of the blessed heights of our soul would be almost dumb if the flowers had not, since centuries, fed with their beauty, the language which we speak, and the thoughts that endeavor to crystallize the most precious hours of life. The whole vocabulary, all the impressions of love, are impregnate with their breath, nourished with their smile. When we love, All the flowers that we have seen and smelt seem to hasten within us to people with their known charms the consciousness of a sentiment whose happiness, but for them, would have no more form than the horizons of the sea or sky. They have accumulated within us since our childhood and even before it in the soul of our fathers an immense treasure, the nearest to our joys, upon which we draw each time that we wish to make more real the clement minutes of our life. They have created and spread in our world of sentiment the fragrant atmosphere in which love delights. Brave old flowers, wallflowers, gillyflowers, stalks, For, even as the field flowers, from which a trifle, a ray of beauty, a drop of perfume, divides them, they have charming names, the softest in the language, and each of them, like tiny, artless, ex-votos, or like medals bestowed by the gratitude of men, proudly bears three or four. You stalks who sing among the ruined walls and cover with light the grieving stones. You garden primroses, primulas, or cowslips, hyacinths, crocuses, crown imperials, scented violets, lilies of the valley, forget-me-nots, daisies, and periwinkles, poets' narcissuses, pheasants' eyes, bear's ears, alyssums, saxifrage, anemones. It is through you that the months that come before the leaf time, February, March, April, translate into smiles, which men can understand the first news and the first mysterious kisses of the sun. You are frail and chilly, and yet as bold-faced as a bright idea. You make young the grass. You are fresh as the water that flows in the azure cups which the dawn distributes over the greedy buds, ephemeral as the dreams of a child, almost wide still and almost spontaneous, yet already marked by the too precocious brilliancy the too flaming nimbus, the too pensive grace, 
that overwhelm the flowers which yield obedience to man. But here, in numerous, disordered, many-colored, tumultuous, drunk with dawns and noons, come the luminous dances of the daughters of summer, little girls with white veils and old maids in violet ribbons, schoolgirls home for the holidays, first communicants, pale nuns, disheveled romps, gossips and prudes. Here is the marigold who breaks up with her brightness the green of the borders. Here is the chamomile like a nosegay of snow beside her unwearying brothers, the garden chrysanthemums, whom we must not confuse with the Japanese chrysanthemums of autumn. The annual helianthus, or sunflower, towers like a priest, raising the monstrance over the lesser folk in prayers and strives to resemble the luminary which he adores. The poppy exerts himself to fill with light his cup torn by the morning wind. The rough larkspur in his peasant's blouse who thinks himself more beautiful than the sky. Looks down upon the dwarf convolvuluses, who reproach him spitefully with putting too much blue into the azure of his flowers. The Virginia stalk, arch and demure in her gown of jaconet, like the little servant maids, of Dordrecht or Leiden, washes the borders of the beds with innocence. The mignonette hides herself in her laboratory and silently distills perfumes that give us a foretaste of the air which we breathe on the threshold of paradises. The peonies, who have drunk their imprudent fill of the sun, burst with enthusiasm and bend forward to meet the coming apoplexy. The scarlet flax traces a blood-stained furrow that guards the walks, and the portulaca, creeping like a moss, studies to cover with mauve, amber, or pink taffeta the soil that has remained bare at the foot of the tall stalks. The chub-faced dahlia, a little round, a little stupid, carves out the soap, lard or wax, his regular pompons, which will be the ornament of a village holiday. The old paternal flocks, standing amid the clusters, lavishes the loud laughter of his jolly, easygoing colors. The mallows, or lavateras, like demure misses, feel the tenderest blushes of fugitive modesty mount to their corollas at the slightest breath. The nasturtium paints his watercolors or screams like a parakeet climbing up the bars of its cage. And the rose mallow, althea rosea, hollyhock, Riding the high horse of her many names, flaunts her cockades of a flesh silkier than a maiden's breast. The snapdragon and the almost transparent balsam are more timorous and awkward and fearfully press their flowers against their stalks. Next, in the discreet corner of the old families are crowded the long-leaved Veronica, the red Potentilla, the African Marigold, the ancient Lychnes or Maltese Cross, the mournful widow or purple Scabious, the foxglove or Digitalis, who shoots up like a melancholy rocket. The European Aquilegia, or Columbine. The Viscaria, who, 
on a long, slim neck, lifts a small, ingenious, quite round face to admire the sky. The lurking Lunaria, who secretly manufactures the Pope's money, those pale, flat crown pieces, with which, no doubt, the elves and fairies, by moonlight, carry on their trade in spells. Lastly, the pheasant's eye, the red valerian, or Jupiter's beard, the sweet William, and the old carnation that was cultivated long ago by the grand Conde in his exile. Besides these, above, all around, on the walls, in the hedges, among the arbors, along the branches, like a people of sportive monkeys and birds, the climbing plants make merry, perform feats of gymnastics, play at swinging, at losing and recovering their balance, at falling, at flying, at looking up at space, at reaching beyond the treetops to kiss the sky. Here we have the Spanish bean and the sweet pea, quite proud at being no longer included among the vegetables, the modest volubius, the honeysuckle, whose scent represents the soul of the dew, the clematis and the glycine, while at the windows, between the white curtains, along the stretched string, the campanula, surnamed Pyramidalis, works such miracles, throws out sheaves and twists garlands formed of a thousand uniform flowers so prodigiously immaculate and transparent that they who see it for the first time, refusing to believe their eyes, want to touch with their finger the bluey marvel, cool as a fountain, pure as a source, unreal as a dream. I have seen them, those whom I have named, and as many whom I have forgotten, all thus collected in the garden of an old sage, the same that taught me to love the bees. They displayed themselves in beds and clusters, in symmetrical borders, ellipses, oblongs, lozenges, surrounded by box hedges, red bricks, earthenware tiles, or brass chains, like precious matters contained in ordered receptacles similar to those which we find in the discolored engravings that illustrate the works of the old Dutch poet Jacob Katz. And the flowers were drawn up in rows, some according to their kinds, others according to their shapes and shades, while others, lastly, mingled, according to the happy chances of the wind and the sun, the most hostile and murderous colors, in order to show that nature acknowledges no dissonance and that all that lives creates its own harmony. From its twelve rounded windows, with their shining panes, their muslin curtains, their broad green shutters, the long painted house, pink and gleaming as a shell, watch them wake at dawn and throw off the brisk diamonds of the dew and then close at night under the blue darkness that falls from the stars. One felt that it took an intelligent pleasure in this gentle, daily fairy scene, itself solidly planted between two clear ditches that lost themselves in the distance of the immense pasturage dotted with motionless cows, while, by the roadside, a proud mill, bending forward like a preacher, made familiar signs with its paternal sails 
to the passers-by from the village. Has this earth of ours a fairer ornament of its hours of leisure than the care of flowers? It was beautiful to see thus collected for the pleasure of the eyes around the house of my placid friend, the splendid throng that tills the light to win from it marvelous colors, honey and perfumes. He found there translated into visible joys, fixed at the gates of his house, the scattered, fleeting, and almost intangible delights of summer, the voluptuous air, the clement nights, the emotional sunbeams, the glad hours, the confiding dawn, the whispering and mysterious azured space. He enjoyed not only their dazzling presence, he also hoped probably unwisely, so deep and confused is that mystery, he also hoped, by dint of questioning them, to surprise, with their aid. I know not what secret law or idea of nature, I know not what private thought of the universe, which perhaps betrays itself in those ardent moments in which it strives to please other beings, to beguile other lives, and to create beauty. What flowers, then, blossomed in the gardens of our fathers? Very few, no doubt, and very small, and very humble, scarce to be distinguished from those of the roads, the fields, and the glades. Before the 16th century, those gardens were almost bare. And later, Versailles itself, the splendid Versailles, could have shown us only what is shown today by the poorest village. Alone, the violet, the garden daisy, the lily of the valley, the marigold, a poppy, a few crocuses, a few irises, the foxglove, the valerian, the larkspur, the cornflower, the clove, the forget-me-not, the gillyflower, the mallow, the rose, still almost a sweet briar, and the great silver lily, the spontaneous finery of our woods and of our snow-frightened, wind-frightened fields. These alone smiled upon our forefathers who, for that matter, were unaware of their poverty. Man had not let learnt to look around him to enjoy the life of nature. Then came the Renaissance, the great voyages, the discovery and invasion of the sunlight. All the flowers of the world, the successful efforts, the deep inmost beauties, the joyful thoughts, and wishes of the planet rose up to us, born on a shaft of light that, in spite of its heavenly wonder, issued from our own earth. Man ventured forth from the cloister, the crypt, the town of brick and stone, the gloomy stronghold in which he had slept. He went down into the garden, which became peopled with azure, purple, and perfumes, opened his eyes, astounded 
like a child escaping from the dreams of the night and the forest, the plain, the sea and the mountains, and lastly, the birds and the flowers which speak in the name of all a more human language which he already understood. Grief is enough.